welcome back to episode 92 of That's So Second Millennium. So this is the first episode of the new year, 2020. It's the first episode of our new format. From this point on, for the foreseeable future, we're going to try to do two episodes a month it's instead of one a week. And the first episode will hopefully be the second Monday of the month. And that will hopefully focus on interviews, and we're going to try, I'm going to try to let Bill take the lead on finding those. He found us a great interview for this first one. So we're going to talk to, you're going to hear our conversation with Dr. Tom Ryba at Purdue University. We were there, again, for ulterior motives, as Bill had some uh, interesting work to do with the uh, School of Engineering. But Dr. Tom Ryba is a fascinating individual. He's the uh, Notre Dame theologian in residence at the Newman Center at St. Thomas Aquinas Parish at Purdue University, an expert on the relationship between science and religion, a person who's written a paper on using mathematical group theory to approach an understanding of the Trinity. Just a fascinating guy, fascinating guy, beautiful conversation, and uh, we're happy to show it to you. Uh, hopefully in two weeks, uh, the plan is for me to take the lead on an episode where uh, Bill and I have a conversation uh, with or without um, an interview with a third party, we talk about some uh, philosophical, scientific, uh, religious issues. So I'm hoping to discuss some philosophy of biology issues with some reading that I've been doing. That's the goal for uh, going forward, and we hope you enjoy this first installment. Thank you for taking the time out, Dr. Ray. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so your, your position with uh, St. Thomas Aquinas Parish mm -hmm. in Purdue is what? How, how should we describe well, that? Well, until this past July, it was the Notre Dame theologian in residence at the center. Is that right? right. Yeah, that's right. Wow. That's fascinating. And I also have a position at Purdue, which is now senior lecturer. That came, that came about sort of accidentally, but that's a long story. Uh, it, in terms of the title now, it's still Notre Dame Theologian, but it's Notre Dame Theologian for the Aquinas Educational Foundation. These oh, are yeah. two separate entities. Okay. The Aquinas Educational Foundation had always managed my um, academic credentials, I guess you'd say. They, they were always uh, the ones who, at the end of the year, received a report from me. And since the last year, I was told by the pastor that I was a... Uh, luxury that could no longer be afforded. I've been here 30 years. But anyway, I have a place in the center. I still have uh, office space and what have you and access to all the um, equipment and so on. So there's not a problem there. My principal position right now, aside from being with the foundation, is with the university itself. So I'm the... Uh, I'm the only senior lecturer in the School of Interdisciplinary Studies. So. Really? Huh. Yeah. Uh, and one thing I've learned by being a, a freelance um, writer of content for uh, for Purdue is that it's a very interdisciplinary place by its very nature. At least yes. maybe that's the kinds of stories that I'm pointed toward. Mm -hmm. But it's, it is a very interdisciplinary place. Am I right? I think that's encouraged. I uh, An example of this is a conference I'm sponsoring, co-sponsoring with Sandra Goodhart, who's the director of Religious Studies. And it's a it's a, uh, um, a conference this coming summer on Girardian theory in AI, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And so the, the whole question of whether machines will ever successfully attain consciousness, but also whether they can mimic human beings, uh, and that's obvious that they do. But that those are some of the themes of the conference. We so far have been getting <laughs> most of the proposals have been within. How would I say the traditional Girardian lines? Not so much in AI, but we've got a great panel from Purdue of professors, mainly from uh, computer science and other areas, who are interested in this issue. And there's one in the humanities who actually is uh, interested in uh, the ethics, the ethics that robots will have to have if they ever become self-aware. So, Fascinating. Yeah. So, so anyway, the conference that's we're in the planning stages, but it looks like it's going to be a great conference. So we've already had. Uh, rather famous French intellectual who's volunteered to be one of the plenary speakers. So, mm, okay. Yeah. yeah. So. And, and what is the Notre Dame uh, connection to the time? The Notre Dame connection is interesting because it was now in the late 60s that the Aquinas Educational Foundation was created. And then as a part of the Educational Foundation, the idea was to offer theology, the, uh, theology classes here at Purdue from Notre Dame. So the first Notre Dame theologians were mostly uh, priests who came down, and they would come down for a semester or so. Mm -hmm. 
after that, uh, and this was probably in the 70s, I think the first layperson was appointed to the position. It's been lay people ever since. Okay. So I'm the 10th, well, was the 10th. I think the, it's ended now. Uh, but I was 10th in a line of, of thinkers and um, who were here uh, as, as lay people. And, uh, and that's probably including the priests as well. But anyway, so there were 10 of us. And, um, and the idea was to offer Notre Dame classes. Well, what happened about 10 years ago, I was getting lots of students from the philosophy side. And so they said, why don't you just move your courses over to Purdue now and teach the courses under the auspices of Purdue, which I did. And that changed the content of the classes a little bit. I had to be more sensitive to the separation between church and state. Indeed. So I couldn't be as much an advocate of a Catholic position in the, in the classes that I taught. But for about 10 years now, they've been entirely moved over to Purdue. I still retain the title. <laughs> the, uh. the bizarre thing is the title is transportable. So um, even though I'm not an um, assistant professor at Notre Dame any longer, which was one of my status. I had, this is very Byzantine, the arrangement, but I had right. a, a status on each side. Yeah. And so now I have the title, but all my work is done at Purdue. So, I see. Yeah. Uh, and has the, uh, the necessarily secular nature of Purdue uh, uh, courses, uh, um, how, how has that changed uh, the teaching and the content? Well, it's a, it's a great question. I, I think I've always maintained that there, there's virtually no difference, aside from my advocacy, personal advocacy of a position, there's no difference in the way I teach. And that's because I would follow the dictum of the um, patristic period, which is all tr truth is Christ's truth. I simply think that there's no conflict. I mean, to answer the question about whether, what the relationship between science and religion is, I don't think there's a conflict. Mm -hmm. And so then it's a question of, of uh, being able to demonstrate in your classes whether what you're teaching seems to be truthful or not. And, uh, I think that's probably the best way to put it. The uh, one thing that has changed, though, is that I don't, I can't in a, in a regular class session uh, speak about my own faith, right? So I have to, I have to speak about it. Um, you can tell students, certainly, if they ask me, but I have to speak about it always, uh, the, the course material in the context of what's generally accepted academic practice, which is fine. You know, mm -hmm. it's, and I don't think it's changed much. <clears throat> My view, you know, I teach a course on New Testament, to take an example, and I started with a Methodist, actually. And uh, <clears throat> that course is, I would say, would be no different whether you know, what I was as far as how I teach it, because it's essentially a course on the history of the New Testament. And, you know, I have my own notions about what's, what's, what constitutes a reliable view, what's not. But I try to make that point. It, I make the same point, uh, argument, same point to anyone. So I, I don't think there's much difference at that level. I also, some years ago, was a recipient of one of the Templeton grants to design courses. Really? And then later I, be, I was a recipient of another grant, which was to establish a community here, which lasted for a little while. Uh, this was the Meta Nexus Foundation, which was a spinoff from the Templeton Foundation. And so we, had, we got a group of people together there regularly to talk about different books of, of, of interest to scientists and theologians or scientists and philosophers for the second, uh, for the second organ, uh, the second grant that was the Meta Nexus grant. For the first, I, I wrote a course uh, outline and then taught the course, I think at least three years on the, um, the development of science and theology and really? how they parallel one another. Oh, and that's my, that's what, my two principal interests are the structure of science versus the structure of theology and then the historical development of each. And so, and that, that, that was a, it was a successful class, an interesting class. It was probably more demanding for uh -huh. the student than a lot because they had to kind of come up to speed on some of the uh, scientific paradigms I was using. But, you know, my own background was I started out interested in physics, thinking I would be a physics major, did a, when I was a senior in high school, uh, yeah. advanced science project and physical chemistry. Yeah. And then uh, when I arrived at the university, discovered philosophy and then, right. and then continued to take philosophy of science, a lot of math, uh, a lot of uh, uh, computer science, actually, when I was uh, uh, in, in school, but mostly philosophy. And yeah. so then that's how I transitioned to religious studies when I was in graduate school. So there was definitely no uh, conflict uh, in, in your own uh, mind and heart. Yeah. Uh, as you yeah. pursued. My approach is that of Augustine's of Hippo. You know, he saw no conflict between science and religion. Yeah. 
Yeah. And in fact, the criteria he uses for reading the scriptures, right? He wrote a, a text called On the Literal Interpretation of Genesis. Yeah. And that text was used by Galileo against the Catholic Church when he was defending his own view. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because, and this is something I point out to my students, I mean, there were really three paradigms at the time. One which was, of course, the, the old uh, geocentric view of the, of the solar system, which came out of the, it was Ptolemaic, and it, it uh, borrowed from Aristotelian ideas. And then there was the new uh, Copernican, or the new Galilean view. And then the third, which was the new development, was the extremely literalistic interpretation, that mm-hmm. this, the Earth must be the center of the universe. The Bible suggests that the, the sun was stopped in the heavens. Yeah. Right? That's the doors our, open for rain to that, come out. Exactly. Yeah. And that was actually, it, it, here's the paradox of it, the most modern view. So my point was that there were many people who were supporters of Galileo inside the church until, of course, there was some friction between the two institutions. I mean, his, his own science and the institution. Oh, and Galileo, to be fair, was a person who invited a certain amount of Yeah, he seemed to be No, you're, you're quite right. He was, yeah, that's right. He was a controversialist. He writes beautifully. His yeah. writing is beautiful. And he was certainly a clear thinker, but he was, uh, he was a gadfly. Yeah. He, was, he was intent on... And creating controversy, I think. And so some of it has to be laid at his door. But my point is just this, that uh, Augustine, writing uh, uh, 10 centuries before yeah. before Galileo, already understood how to balance the two. And he, he sets out a, a set of criteria, which are very good criteria. Yeah. And I've never yeah. found this to be problematic. And, I, and, and part of it is because I think the difficulty is that what sometimes students consume is scientism and not science best scientists understand that they don't know things. So. Yeah. yeah. Right. And yeah. Uh, in attending some of the uh, Society of Catholic Scientists uh, events, for instance, we've seen that uh, uh, astrophysicists and uh, planetary <laughs> geologists, biologists, uh, they, they fit the model you're describing perfectly. Uh, in fact, the awe yeah. of the universe uh, it drives them toward both science and faith. That's right. Uh, but uh, uh, it's not necessarily always the same case, for instance, with some biologists, mm-hmm. etc., because there's that feeling, maybe if you're studying medicine or something, mm-hmm. uh, it, it's much more comfortable to think that uh, we don't really need God because I'm I'm doing fine as God right now. Right, right. right. I'm able to cure the cancer. Yeah, and, yeah. 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 So I don't know if that if you've seen yeah. no, I, that kind of... Uh, I think that's true. I mean, yeah. the... the and I have a number of scientist friends on campus. One of them is in the structural biology group. He's an Orthodox Jew. And again, he it's, it's interesting because his ethical views come down pretty much in conformity with Roman Catholicism on many things. And his view is a, a great humility. And yet he's designing byri, you know, to use them as living uh, yeah. syringes, right? Yeah. Uh, right, to, to disrupt different kinds of bacteria and what have you. But he was, uh, to take an example... We were talking about how ethical it is to bioengineer certain things. And he says, in his view was, if nature already is engaged in the bioengineering of something, for example, um, rice, that rice has a very loose genetic structure, he said, then he doesn't see a problem with it. But this idea that we should alter the human genome you know, mm-hmm. to give people eyes that like yeah. cats that can see in the dark and so on, right. he said, this is, this is where it has to stop. This is dangerous. Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm sort of rambling here, but but my point is, I think that there are scientists. This interview will fit right in with the rest of our podcast. Is that right? <laughs> no. okay. Well, you know, the thing is, I I love this stuff, and it's yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. we do too. That's why we do it. <laughs> there you go. Everything else. Yeah. There you go. But anyway, uh, the point is, point being, that there are scientists who would not hesitate uh, to introduce all kinds of genetic material into human embryos oh, and yeah. can create all kinds of monsters for whatever purposes. But there are also disciplined scientists, often religious. And here at Purdue, you have more religious scientists than I've encountered. In fact, I would say if you compare the humanities faculty to the science faculty, including engineering, you'd find many more people who are believers on the science side than Wow, fascinating. Yeah. 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 I always did get us. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah. uh, we visited when, when uh, our daughter was considering coming here. Mm-hmm. And we would have loved it uh, based on what we were learning because sure. we did sense a great spirit of yeah. Service to humanity and sure. and really wanting to, to make a difference for the common good and very great friendliness I think toward the different religious denominations. Indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's uh, 
there's great compatibility. In fact, I think most of the ministries on campus have some counseling component that is that is completely integrated with the uh, regular counseling on campus hmm. because they understand some people need yeah. more than secular counseling. So yeah. Yeah, they'll often send them in one direction. That's off the topic. But, yeah. No, yeah. no. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, do you think that Purdue really is uh, different on, on that score and that the concerns uh, that are so prevalent now about science uh, driving out religion, especially in the minds of young people, uh, how, how do you see that uh, reflecting itself? Then? Yeah, I th- as I say, I think, um, I think the whole, this whole episode with postmodernism in the humanities, particularly in yeah. English lit and to some extent in philosophy, not as uh, prominent in philosophy, I think that that has had a rather detrimental effect. I, there's something going on in the culture, too. I mean, when I started teaching here 30 years ago, the students, I would say there were maybe 15% of the students had no idea what religion was. It's now about 30%. <sighs> yeah. yeah. So I find 30% of my students are unchurched or un, you know, yeah. never been in a synagogue, never been in a mosque. Yeah. And yeah. so when they take my classes, they're actually in the class to find out what is this thing called religion. Wow. Yeah. And they will typically report, well, my grandmother was in some way religious, but my parents were not, and we were never taken anywhere. Yeah. So there's been a change in the, the demographics. And then the other part of it is I would, my little experience is that I, of course, went to a uh, university which was Methodist affiliated, Northwestern. But by the time I was there, had no real, yeah, had, had no real yeah. major. Like so so many private schools, right? Yeah. Right. Like that. It's secular board of governors. And then I taught at Michigan State for four years. And I would say in comparison, um, yes, Purdue is a much friendlier environment. Mm. And why? I guess the culture has just grown up that way. Um, like, yeah, the high and, and yeah. so on. Yeah. Yeah. And, and people, uh, young people simply aren't uh, exposed to mm. even the, the most basic the ethos of religion that you'd find in uh, a, a Judeo-Christian uh, culture, um, much less the actual uh, specifics of religions. Well, the unchurched ones, right, as, I, as I'm calling them, they seem to get all they, they know about Christianity, Judaism, Islam, whatever it happens to be, from television. So yeah. that's, yeah. that's the full extent. Yeah. And, and, and also, the internet is a big influence now, too. So there are a lot of websites on the internet that are uh, positively anti-religious, yeah. and and they buy a lot of it until they begin to discover what religion yeah. is really like. It's more robust than they imagine. They uh, they imagine oh, yeah. a straw man of some sort. I think. Yeah, yeah. In which case, yeah. Reading yeah. reading Richard Dawkins. Or yes, Dawkins Christopher Hitchens' take on religion. Dawkins whatever. being the worst commentator on religion that's imaginable. I think. Yeah, I mean, and yeah. and if there's a there's family history there too. So he's pushing oh, against his right. yeah. Against oh yeah, his, was it Lawrence father. Krauss, the physicist who wrote uh, Universe from Nothing? I don't know it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I read yeah. that yeah. book. That's that's really the only like out there new atheist book that yeah. I've actually yeah. taken the time to read. Yeah, I don't know. And uh, I was so disappointed in that book. One yeah. because I re- I picked that book because okay, here's a physicist going to explain me some physics. Yes, while he gives me some some of the stuff. So I'll I'll, I'll and he disappointed me on that front because yeah. he didn't explain enough physics. <laughs> yeah. And then it was like so much. That book was like. This man had father issues. Yeah. Like he was, there were pages where I felt like he was practically screaming it at the reader yes. that I had this, yes. you know, this issue. Yeah. That's a, actually that's a common pattern in academia that, that yeah. people will often uh, reject the religious upbringing, especially it's the father. Yeah. It, 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 it probably there are the mother issues with some people, but it seems right. to do that. Yeah. yeah it seems yeah. to be common. And, of course, at the other extreme, you've got people like Tipler who have written these books, The Physics of Immortality, yeah. and other books, uh, The Anthropic uh, Principle. Yeah. And in his books, he does the other thing, which I think is also problematic, which is to <laughs> subordinate theology to, to the physics, right? To make, yeah. to make the theology explicable in terms of the physics. Yeah. And that's also questionable. Um, yeah. m- myself, you know, I try to tell my students there's an old distinction between what's the supernatural, the preternatural, and the natural. And I argue that the preternatural is what we don't know to be natural. Mm-hmm. We just, at the moment, think it's beyond the realm of possibility and what have you. The supernatural is what only God can do. And there, that allows a lot of leeway between, you know, and, and it, it introduces care in making assumptions about what's... Uh, Possible or impossible, what you know, whether miracle.
miracles, for example, are impossible or impossible. Yeah. Some some miracles are within the realm of nature, I would say. Others may be, well, supernatural. Yeah. So at, one, at what point does a coincidence become so monstrous that we refer to it as That's a... right. That's right. I mean, uh, you know, if, 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 as some people suggest, the... the uh, you know, the crossing of the Reed Sea is explicable by an island exploding in the Mediterranean. I mean, this is a fanciful right. hypothesis, but... Uh, I've, then, I've heard that before, yeah, definitely, yeah. But the coincidence is that they arrive exactly at the moment that they can cross, right? <laughs> so, a miracle <laughs> of <laughs> coincidence, yeah, right? Yeah. So, a miracle of very coincidence. very night, <laughs> this thing that does not happen <laughs> yes. more than once in 10,000 years. Yes. Yeah. So, a miracle of coincidence, if that's a historical event, and... Uh, and, you know, I'm kind of open-minded about some of these things in the Bible because I think that, as C.S. Lewis said about Genesis, until you get to the uh, uh, patriarchal narratives, it's, you know, it's a platonic myth. It's intended to teach a lesson and shouldn't be interpreted as literally as uh, some people do. Right? Yeah. But you can still get everything you need from it uh, and certainly form the basis of Christian yeah. theology on the basis of that. Yeah. Well, we tend to assume that ancient people must have been so. St- I mean, there's that, that's that this great modern fallacy of assuming that ancient people are so stupid. Yes, but like you know that they couldn't notice, for example, that Genesis one tells a story, yes, and Genesis right. two tells a story, <laughs> right, with some of the same elements in a different order. Yes, and we we assume, oh well, they they didn't even yeah. see these contradictions. Like I bet they did. Precisely. <laughs> well, you know, on this point, all the rabbinic commentators recognize this, right? The rabbinic yeah. commentators are the ones yeah. in the tradition, steeped in the tradition, yeah. who don't have right uh, a, an especially literalistic interpretation of their own right. text, right? And so I, I've been helped a great deal because I've been friends with a, um, a number of uh, Jewish thinkers on campus, and one of them is very much into Jewish midrash, Sandra Goodhart. And, and uh, the thing that has become apparent to me, especially through my association with him, is this idea that um, if you want to understand how the tradition itself understands itself, right, which is helpful to Christians as well, yeah. you should probably go to those commentaries. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I think is that is that one of the things that drives the wedge um, even in Catholic high schools, uh, where the, the, the kids just uh, you know are turned off uh, by their religion classes. Right. Right. Well, uh, I, am I right that a lot of a lot of the time it's because the religion classes um, are presented as uh, simply memorize mm-hmm. these black and white. Yes. rules, mm-hmm. uh, and science is uh, much more exciting and dynamic because right. there are experiments to conduct and discussions to have yes. and uh, observations Although, oddly to enough, make. the students always wanted me to reduce science to a list of facts to memorize. Yeah, that's, Interesting. Yeah, that's Good right. point. Right. <laughs> Boy, there's a lot to say about this. I think, I think the millennials, yeah, I'm going to say yeah. something, but uh, I think the millennials tend to be much more oriented toward road memorization, and I think it's a function uh-huh of the fact that so many high schools, so many grammar schools, and my wife could talk about this at length. She, yeah. she teaches, used to teach gifted children. They teach to the test now. So yeah. so 20% of their time is preparation for standardized tests. Yeah. And my wife said that kills teaching. Yeah. Uh, so so there's a part of this which says, what, and I'll have students say to me, will you give me a practice test? And I said, I simply don't give practice tests. Yeah. I'm sorry, they don't. Yeah. Uh, you should know more than what's on the test anyway. Yeah. But but that's a part of it. And the other part of it is, I think, that um, in some Catholic high schools, the catechism plays a kind of central role in religious education. I have no objections to the catechism. Sure. But it uh, has to be read right. And everything that's in the catechism isn't what we would call um, uh, absolute dogma. Dog- it's not dogma. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. there are theories that are expressed in the catechism as well. Yeah. So. To understand Every it, the last bishop in the world yeah. had their own little yeah. some, some sentence they inserted in that, that know, they wanted to express that way. That's right, and usually you can tell what the the, the, the I don't like the word dogmatic, but the dogmatic portions are yeah. right. You can clearly understand what is what must be believed, and then a lot of it is up for debate. Um, also, I think lots of people who are teaching theology these days they've been much more influenced by the social sciences than the hard sciences, yeah. and at one time. I think theology was much more closely linked to the hard sciences, and I think that that was for for the better. Yeah, I think that there were people who were good mathematicians, who were good physicists, good chemists, and so on, who are yeah. who also knew, uh, or who were theologians, but who also did those things, and and um, that 
can only help. Yeah, explain that for a minute. I'm not, uh, yeah. I'm not quite following. What, what, what yeah. is the advantage of, of the connection well, between those two? We things? develop metaphors, right, in mm-hmm. theology in order to explain things. So to take yeah. an example, I, some years ago I wrote an article about um, the Trinity. Now, when you read people's comments on the Trinity, and, and I don't dispute this, it's a mystery that can't be fully understood, period. Yeah, yeah, I'm with true. that, I'm with yeah. that. But, how, but one of the things about especially Western theology, and here I'm talking about the Protestant and the Roman Catholic tradition, is that they, they push the envelope on this. They want to understand as much as is possible. Yeah. And the limits are never put on that, right? That, that it's a mystery and that you cannot plumb the depths of it. Yeah. That's a given. So the, the question then becomes, how much can we know? And what I discovered, and this was actually based on the master's uh, uh, thesis I wrote, I discovered that you could use something called the mathematical theory of groups in order to describe the Trinitarian structure. So I wrote a little essay about this, Mm -hmm. and uh, it felt like a concrete cloud because people don't typically find this an interesting thing. But but what you can do is you can establish an analogy, right? Yeah. You can say that these two things are analogous to one another and that, and that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit can be explained using these, these relations, mathematical relations. And that clears up the supposed contradictory nature of it. You know, some people will often say, well, yeah. how can you have three that's one? Yeah. And they're all the three beings, but how can three beings be one being? And so on. Most of the language of, of the creedal formulations give us the tools to do that. But then, of course, it's left to us to give us, you know, yeah. for every generation, a creative interpretation. Yeah. And so I think, uh, I think that's, um, people often get this idea about dogma. Uh, dogma is expandable. It's expandable infinitely. But what, when you're expanding it, you can't contradict what's been laid down as a common understanding. Right. right. So, so, I mean, you can add and add and add. And you can theory. build yes. onto the dog. That's right. Exactly right. What you build is not a dog, that, but you can build onto the dog. That's right. That's right. And uh, depending on the tradition, of course, you know, Things don't move down from dogma, but things move up into dogma. Things that have been taught consistently, constantly. Yeah. And the Marian, you know, for yeah. Catholics, the Marian yeah. doctrine. Yeah. Are examples. Yeah. And then there are things that could be hard, mm-hmm. in, in inevitable logical consequences of dogmas, yes. but yes. have to themselves be dogmas. That's right, exactly. Uh, by inference, um, to be sure, that was the big discovery. Uh, Christian theologians realized you could introduce truths of revelation into the syllogism and draw mm-hmm. new conclusions, as long as your science was good, right? If your right. science was faulty, yeah. Well, then it's the easiest thing to do to yeah. make either your premises or your structure faulty. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it's the weakest chain in the argument, yeah. right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I am so fast. I, that, the paper about the Trinity and group theory, as as someone whose PhD is in crystallography, okay. or has to know a modicum of group theory, you, I want to read this. Thing. <laughs> I'll send it to you. I, I, it's, I got a PDF of it. I can send it to you immediately. Uh, the uh, one of my best friends on campus was a crystallographer. Okay, and he he died some years ago, but oh, yeah, uh, uh, Roberto Colella. But he was an Italian uh, school, I think, principally in Italy, and then was on faculty here. And he knew he knew Fermi. He knew uh, a number of the greats. Oh gosh! And yeah. and uh, he was a great guy. Yeah, just a fan, 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 and, a, and a devout Catholic too, mm-hmm. but not a um, not simple one. Had yeah. a sophisticated view of the universe, yeah. and also was. Uh, it's a consistent uh, Orthodox Catholic, so and it could be done. Yeah, it's a yeah. question of how. I think humility is at the root of this, right? How how humble are you willing to allow yourself to be? Because we really know just a you know, just looking. We're like we're wandering in the dark with a flashlight. We can see the beam of the flashlight, and yeah. the rest of it is dark. So, and that's and true. If we keep drawing on our map. We have you know, we have figured out some more things. But, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's and still I, a lot yeah. more to explore. Yeah, no, that's right. <laughs> and I would argue, I would argue that in, structurally, science and theology are very similar at points, and then there are major differences as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and it's a question of respecting the difference, I suppose. Yeah. In some sense. Yeah. 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 But, but summing up, it sounds like uh, your experience with uh, undergrads here and uh, just the overall academic environment, uh, you, you'd be more hopeful than many. Analysts of the situation who who see this real uh, crisis of incom- uh, incompatibility as perceived by young people uh, between science and religion. Yeah, the thing that's surprising to me here, which I didn't experience at at Michigan State, and then probably in graduate school, I'm not sure I was aware of it at Northwestern, but 
there are lots of young people here in the sciences who have active theological interests, active religious interests. Um, I'll just tell a quick story. My One of my best students was an electrical engineering major and taking my classes as a graduate student. Now, a number of graduate students do this, and they usually ask me to keep it off the books because they don't want their chemistry dissertation director or whatever oh, it is to notice that they're doing other things. They wow. should be utterly devoted. But anyway, but, <laughs> but he was... he was Yeah, a, I get that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> he was a brilliant, uh, brilliant uh, student, and he developed an algorithm for the recovery of, of telemetry data from satellites, and at the time, wow. it boosted the ability to recover from something like in the 70s and 80s to uh, in the 90s. Mm-hmm. And it actually became famous. So he's a part, he's, his name is Luis Jimenez, he's now father of Luis Jimenez, but he is at the, oh, okay. uh, Ar- he was he's, was for years at the Arecibo Dish, the imaging group that's mm-hmm. connected with it. All right. Well, there have been a lot of priests that have been good astronomers over the years. He, he, he is, he, yeah, he's an interesting guy. So for years, I knew that he was working down there. He achieved tenure, and, and then you, we'd be in touch with one another. And he used to start taking theology courses in summer at Notre Dame. He was going to get a THD, uh, uh, a, P, a THD, I guess. And uh, one summer called me up and he said, Tom, I want to tell you something. I said, you're going to become a priest. And he said, yes. So he's actually now a Jesuit priest. And he's, he's giving lectures all over Latin America. But he also retains his position at Mayaguez and Puerto Rico University of Mayaguez. Mm. But... To take that as an example, that's not, I found this not to be atypical. Mm-hmm. There are many, uh, I've had an international uh, crew of students who've taken my classes and have gone on, and they're, they're a lively intellects who still retain their, their orthodoxy in one form or another. And, and a lot of my students, I would say a third of my students are not Catholics at all. You know, a third are unchurched, a third are not Catholic, a third are Catholics, mm-hmm. maybe. And, um, they manage to go on and, and have healthy faith lives. So. Mm-hmm. And open-mindedness that yes. spans both, or transcends both the religion world yes. and the science. Yeah, the compatibility, I think, for a certain kind of mind is not an issue. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend. You can email a link to this episode at thatsosecondmillennium.net, share the post for this episode from our Facebook page, or you can use your podcast app's built-in sharing feature. Our intro music is Mars, the bringer of war, and our outro music is Venus, the bringer of peace. From the Planet Suite by Gustav Holst, performed by the U.S. Air Force Heritage of America Band. The recording is in the public domain and made available by MuseOpen.org. For my co-host Bill Schmidt, I'm Paul Geesting. Thanks for listening to another episode of That So Second Millennium.